Here we are, I've got another exciting JBL 515 for repair. Um, I'm fed up with doing these to be honest, and I haven't got time to do them anymore, so I'm just going to show you guys how to do them. Oh, there's an arrow in my heart. Yeah, so um, this one's come from a French customer. Um, they come from all over the world actually, but this one's a froggy one. Pardon my French, but it is. And let's tie up my lighting clamp. And yeah, it's um, the power supply input, the <clears throat> switch mode power supply transistors are blown, which is interesting because those transistors are no longer manufactured by an Infineon, the ones that are specified. So I use different ones. And this one has also got um, the LF amplifier output stages blown as well, which is slightly unusual to have them both, but I have seen where they're both blown. And um, I think this one fails first and the LF output overloads the power supply and the power supply keeps trying to start up and eventually it blows the transistors as far as I can make out I mean who knows why a power fit blows it's very difficult to catch them in the act I've seen them go at various gigs and amplifiers and stuff like that when it's been sitting there idling and doing nothing at all and they just go pop gone and uh, yeah could they ever be possibly 100% reliable? The answer is yes, because I've got Panasonic TVs the last 15 years, and I've got a plasma Panasonic TV which is about, takes about 280 watts, and that's 12 years old with no failure, and um, we've got three Panasonic TVs, and the one preceding that as well. So for the last 20 years, none of our Panasonic TVs have ever failed, and they've all got switch mode power supplies in them. So the answer is yes, you can make them reliable, um, but not many people know how to do so. All right. So, yeah, without messing about any further, I'm going to, to macro mode, and then you can um, I'll point out the components need changing. All right. One moment. Okay. So I'll give you a few seconds there to get yourself oriented as to where we are on the board. Okay. There's the the um, two transistors for the switch mode power supply I've taken out. I'm just going to run through here very quickly and tell you what to change. All right. And if you don't change all of these and you try to put new transistors in, well, they're a couple of quid each, $2 each. Every time you turn it on, put power on, it's going to cost you $4. So just get ahead, go ahead and bite the bullet and change the bloody components, all right? A number of time I've told that to engineers that have just um, wasted lots of things hoping that they can skimp on the repair, but you can't. You need to change everything. Everything has been stressed for years now, probably four or five years old, this product. Everything has been stressed change everything that's been stressed my advice I've done hundreds of these um, I like to think I know what I'm talking about but somebody's always clever and I am so uh, yeah leave your comments by the way if you are bored by this or it's too slow for you go and watch another channel rather than leaving snotty comments okay you might think you're clever but um, you're not really helping are you uh, this is to help people who've got dodgy amplifiers can't get them fixed to have a go if you know what the voltage issues are in terms of Electric shock, it's dangerous. There's 300 odd volts on here on a UK mains or European mains. Um, in, unless you're sure you know what you're doing, don't operate it with the covers off and don't take it apart immediately after it's been switched on because these things hold charge and then give you a nasty belt. All right, so anyway, without further ado, let's have a quick look. There you go, we're in the um, zoomed in version of um, what we were just looking at. It's quite dusty, this thing, isn't it? I don't know where it's been. <coughs> right, so two transistors there. One and two, that's the two power fets. Yeah, this must be an old version. Look, the different lead spacing on those uh, compared to the ones I've seen before. And interesting enough, this had um, torque screws holding the heat sink in as well, which uh, are normally just ordinary crosshead screws. So I'm guessing this is maybe a pretty old one. But anyway, I've done most of what needs to be done already. My light has just fallen off. There we go, put that back on. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, right, so what we got is these are normally uh, 1206, I think, 10 ohm resistors. I put larger ones in because they can blow, and um, invariably they're blown. So change these two 10 ohm resistors, okay? You've got these two transistors here, they're both in a Darlington type. Um, actually, no, they're not Darlington, they're complementary drive for the gate. Uh, complementary drive on this side, complementary drive on that side. These 49.9 ohm resistors go. One there, 
one there so change those all right now um, I'm trying to remember what these transistors are now uh, just get the packets one moment I'll show them to you right you can see can't you on that screen it says J1 wire right you can see that can't you can you see that yes you can so J1 wire and I'm pointing to this one in the drive transistors all right the drive transistors for the uh, FPT gate all right J1 wire is that one? Oh, can you see it? Uh, that's the Farnell part number 2453936, and that's the transistor part number. And it is the PMP version, that's the PMP side. So J1Y is PMP, right? And I know it is because look, I wrote it on my packet. Aren't I clever? And uh, the K1Ys, ooh. Um, you can't actually see it on here, but that transistor there says K1Y, and that's the other one. So it's Q603 and Q601 are K1Y, and that's the complementary NPN version of the same thing in the driver pair. And there they are. RS, oh sorry, Farnell 2453954. You can look it up. If you put that number there into the Farnell website, you can uh, get the data sheet and enjoy yourself, all right? Q601, Q603, I've written on the packet again, K1Y, and that's the manufacturer's part number of that transistor, all right? So that's the two complementary pairs that drive the gate, and you'll be, ch ooh, focus, you focusing thing. You'll be changing those two. One, two, and three, four, all right? Okay, so now what else have we got? We've got this chip here. Uh, there's two chips here. One chip there, and one chip there. And I've put them down somewhere, haven't I? Um, yeah, so that's... Uh, let's have a look. Yeah. That chip there, look. This one. Him. That's the... Um, Half-bridge FET gate driver. It's supposed to make sure that not both pairs of... Both pets can be switched on at both times. Both boost the output. And this is for this. This um, is this is um, giving more oomph to the drive from this from this pin here through this complementary pair. All right. So you're going to change that. If you don't change it, more for you. And it's a fan seven three zero eight zero MX. That's the one now. And uh, what number we got. This is Farnell again, 2083935. So you can read that freeze frame, enjoy yourself. That's that one there. And we've got, we've got, we've got. Um, no, that's not the right one. Where are we? TL, there we are. This one down here is the other one that gets blown up. Yeah, him. Um, and that's the part number of that one. Basically, it's a PWM power supply controller. It uh, does all the management of the power supply for you at 200 kilohertz. Uh -huh. 272 for now. So you're going to change that as well because they're invariably blown. When these FETs go kapoo, the high voltage comes down the um, low voltage side and um, yeah, frying tonight basically. Um, now, what else normally goes? Now, after you've changed all those, right, and you've changed them carefully with due diligence. Um, and you power it up and it doesn't work then what can you do? What you can do is look over here basically on the universal switching version of this there is a couple of components can you see oh, I can't remember what that's called now I'm going to look that up for you in a minute but they occasionally when the 15 volt rail on here gets fried up this is a lockout circuit and a detector comparator which checks the input voltage coming in through the mains and then switches this relay here, this evil, no, wait a minute, it's not the relay, that's the relay. Oh, 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 where are we? Oh, I'm sorry guys, sorry about this, I'm, there it is. So that is the relay that switches out the, the voltage doubling circuit to give these the 300 volts they require if you're running from 110 and not 220, right? That relay gets stuck everything gets fried and exploded. It's a horrible thing. 
Um, really not needed in Europe actually because we're pretty much generally all 110 unless we're doing a public performance in a tent or something like that and the old health and safety people have been involved insisting that everything runs from 110 like on a building site but yeah generally um, on my own stuff I take this out because I've been here messing about with the variac on the input side to the unit when I've been testing it and then fiddling the I wonder what happens if I wind the voltage up and down and I wound the voltage up and down on my variac to 110 back to 220 and it made a funny noise and went bang and um, blew up the fets. I thought well that's charming so you could imagine that happening, couldn't you? An outage or a storm or something like that, or some power lines if you're in a pub somewhere playing and uh, the old lines get shorted out. You could imagine easily it could dip to 110 and then come back. Um, but it was curtains, so yeah, I take this relay out because it's not really needed in in the uh, in Europe. If you're running on 200 volts plus, you're fine. This whole this horrible relay over here, that one is driven by the 5 volt side of the secondary and that um, shorts out this actually this thing just here I mean, this is a very close up view you're getting here you're not charging you extra for this you know just I can't I'm getting lost I can't find everything I'm looking for where is it there it is it's glued to the back of there that's the PTC a positive temperature coefficient thermistor and when you put the power on that starts heating up and it starts to heat up, but just in time, when the DC power on here comes on, the 5 volt or the whatever 15 volt railway is, comes on, switches this relay. That relay then shorts that thermistor out, preventing it going, um, getting any hotter. Because when it gets a bit hotter, it goes virtually open circuit and the amplifier will shut down. So it's a way of not having a fuse. If there's a bad short on this side, this thing just gets cooked quickly. There's nothing to switch this on the secondary side because the power supply is gone. So your thermistor basically goes up. So you've just got a very low current AC going into the shorted unit without any explosions or fireworks. It's the sort of thing you put in when you expect it to blow up and you're not really confident in design, to be honest. Because um, a fuse would have done, wouldn't it? Or would it? I don't know. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, so one final thing you need to change. Over here is very nasty and I mean very nasty I've seen these chips in washing machines and tumble dryers and dishwashers to control the electronics and I've seen them even just driving LEDs for a, an LED lamp in the hospital bed thing and it's a buck regulator that takes the 300 odd volts in switches it through this 1000 1000 micro Henry yeah, thousand micro Henry coil. That doesn't look very healthy, does it? Actually, but in any case, um, focus. When you switch them on, you can see this sparking sometimes. More often than not, and this is naturally a high voltage inductor. You bear in mind you've got three hundred volts on here, and you've got about um, fifteen volts on the secondary, controlled by this chip smoothed by that capacitor and there's a buck, buck diode and all the rest of it okay but this circuit is unreliable these are unreliable that's unreliable so I'm gonna change that and that actually because I fixed these amplifiers before and I've been sitting there looking at oh aren't I clever I fixed it and then you see a little spark and a crackle and then suddenly this thing goes wrong and, and 300 volts on this side a piece of copper wire around a coil around a ferrite a ferrous a ferrite um, bobbin out the other end um, when this shuts down or goes wrong you can get um, some serious voltage on the secondary side of the DC and that DC voltage goes off and dries all these chips all these chips over here so that's why it's necessary to change all these chips and as I say if you change all those and it still doesn't work you need to change that which is pretty fine pitch and that as well and I can't remember the name or the part number of that one. I've got them in the bag around here somewhere in the tray. I'll stick that on the end so that you know what you've got to do, all right? Now, on the um, power amplifier side, the LF amplifier, there's all the servo and the switching stuff that um, makes the control signals, the gate control switching signals via these two drivers down here. 
these ones, that one and that one. Fire this pig of a circuit up here, which is a buffer, and two more complementary drivers, and a terrible smoothing capacitor. I mean, honestly, really. Really? Yeah. Um, and then down to these four, which is, you can see, it's actually plastered in splat, but um, they're underneath here, there is one, two, three. There's one transistor, another transistor, that's just a blob of solder on there. Um, another transistor, and you can see I've taken this side out because they are shorted, but I'm going to change all of them. The necessary, <laughs> the fets that I need to change are all here in my hand. All right, and I'll go through those in a minute. All right, so a handful of fets, a fistful of fets, as they say, and then on this side, you've got these components to worry about. Um, uh, which one is it? One of these is a fast switching diode, which is in the gate driver circuit, and it's got a... 84 ohm resistor across it I think and when these FETs go that um, diode blows and again do I have the diode number of that um, do you know what I should have prepared for this a bit better shouldn't I not big and it's not clever preparation makes up for piss poor performance but I thought I would do the piss poor performance instead of the preparation frankly, because this is just a, a shout out out there for anybody who's stuck on this bloody thing, how to fix them. Um, as I say, I've done a lot of them. Do you know what? I'm fed up with them now. Um, I'm just going to find the packets of those two components and I'll tell you what they are. Hold on. Yeah, somebody's um, fairly unfriendly -ly -ly -ly, squished this board with all this uh, white splodge. So the... Uh, The diode you need to see is... Do you know what? I'm bullshitting again. Let me have a quick look. Now, now we've got it. Now we've got it. Quick cup of tea later. Uh, right, so you've got... Uh, 368, 371. There are four of these diodes in this uh, unit. Can you see that? Can you see that? I bet you can't. I can't see it either. Right, it's a bit too macro, isn't it? I mean, I'm I'm trying to do. You can read this on a small phone, can you? Um, where are we? Yeah. So that's the part number ZCHS1000. It's a fast Schottky switching diode. Um, signal diode, really, but um, a fairly special one, really, I suppose. Uh, made by Diodes Inc., not Monsters Inc., and it's from Farnell. So that's the Farnell stock number. 9526773, alright. Now there's four of those, and they're all in the drive circuits. And for the P, uh, FQP 17P06, the P channel FETs, they've got a 24.9 ohm resistor in parallel with them, okay? So you can't test those diodes easily without removing them from the board. And you've got, um, they, so on the P-channel FET, you've got a 24.9 ohm resistor, and on the N-channel FET, it's complementary partner, remember there's two pairs, you've got um, an 84.5 ohm resistor in series with, in parallel with the the, um, the diode, and one end of that goes to the gate of the FET, and the other end goes to that driver circuit with the horrible transistors. Right, so you've got DC Thrix. 368, D369, D371, and D370, and it's these diodes dotted around here, you can see them okay, if this wasn't splodged up, I'm sorry that it's splodged, but nothing I can do, um, 366 and 367, and diodes... 372 and 373 according to me don't hardly ever blow up so you've got to you've got to check you've got to take off check and or replace um, 368 369 381 and 380 
318, 381, right? So they're under there. So change those diodes. Check the um, 24.9 resistor and uh, uh, under there. And can you see one? There's 24.9. There's one there, look, you see, across that uh, diode. And then there's an 84.5 as well on the P side. So this is the P side. This is the P channel FET, this one. All right? So there's one there and there's one under there. You can't. You can just see the edge of it there. Okay. So check, change those four components. Um, I'll check those four diodes. Check all those four resistors, and then before, you, if you have an oscilloscope, before you put the uh, FETs in, you can power this up and measure the gate drive signal to make sure you've got drive on both of them. Right? Because otherwise it won't work. There is this drive circuitry up here has been known to blow up, but generally speaking, they survive. But if you are feeling um, adventurous and you want to do a good job, I would put another 20 odd microfarad new capacitor across this little chappy because he's under some pressure there. And I've seen those fail and get very low, and it just sort of eats away at the um, drive, the power capability of the driving circuit when that starts to get. Um, um, low capacitance, all right. So you can change that as well, and it does sharpen up the gates quite a bit. So there you go. So that's what you need to change. And all things been equal, um, without getting into this servo circuitry, there is a clock over here. There's a clock generator there. I think that's 500 kilohertz crystal, and then that's just a logic divider chip. That chip can blow up. So make sure you clock your 250 kilohertz clock is going down this end of the board. There's the ribbon cable. All right, we've got a, a low view there. And it comes into the end up here. And it's divided by this chip. That can get blown up as well. But generally speaking, you should have a nice um, 250 kilohertz clock bouncing around. And when I do what I've just told you to do, which is change those components there, and if necessary, change these components here, um, it should work, right? And then invariably they do work. But if you've got two of these transistors blown on the output stage, do yourself a favor and change all of them. All right. Now, um, these things here are supposed to be, the transistors in the power supply are supposed to be, what are they supposed to be? to be I've got on my list yeah so they are a trench stop uh, power transistor not FETs they're the old fashioned vision right um, now they say in the data sheet they're infinium parts and it says in the data sheet they're for things like super critical power supplies and high reliability designs and of course they're only going to be as good as the other circuitry around them because these things need a lot of protection. They're right at the firing line. They're standing in the middle of the high voltage motorway, won't be mowed down by a transient truck. Um, where are we? Yeah, it's supposed to be GB20650P01. GB220B60P01. That's what they're supposed to be. And I think I've got one of those. But they're obsolete. They don't make them anymore. A few people have got them in, but they've recently gone obsolete. And so, what I've got instead is, after doing a bit of research, get the original ones if you can. But if you can't, um, where's my trench drop transistors I ordered just come in? QP, that's the wrong one. Q36367. Oh dear. Where's my trench stop power diodes? Right, okay, that's what they're supposed to be. If you can get hold of those, that's the part number of the part. That's the final part number. That's the uh, final order code. But if you look, they say no longer manufactured by Infineon. Right, so we've got a problem on our hands, but 
do you know what I've spent that was looking through data sheets deciding which one to get would be a, a reasonable equivalent and uh, you're going to leave back you're going to leave me a bad comment for this aren't you I know you are hold on a minute I'll just find them right here we are back in talk amongst yourselves yeah, here's the uh, this whiteboard instead it's not a 20 amp trench drop diode it's a trench drop transistor with a soft switch diode inside uh, TO220 same connections as the other one and as far as I can make out it's pretty similar in specification except that this might be the um, the lead free version although these should be manufactured um, under RHS anyway so I'm not sure but looking at the data sheet there's very little difference um, so I'm going to fit these because you can't get the other ones and if um, I've been fitting them for a while and they work fine so that's what I'm using get the originals if you can but a push fit these little buggers okay as an equivalent so I'm going to go through and just change all that stuff um, hot air gun, soldering iron, you don't want to see all that if you want to see how to do the video um, how to do the soldering and how change the components have changed just have a look at some of my other videos but I don't have time but if you've got one of these and you follow those steps and you carefully replace the items and obviously look at the other videos about how this is mounted back onto the onto the um, onto the actual controller on the metal work on the heatsink because um, there are these evil pads evil insulator pads that go behind the the transistors and um, regulators and you know you can see actually this has got bits of metal in it sometimes you get little bits of swarf trapped in it punctures through and short actual transistors onto the heatsink which is not fun all right so that's that so I'm just gonna go and rip through and change these parts so I can get off and go home and spend some time with my family so I hope you find that interesting change those bits and you're likely to have some success well, well here she is <coughs> I've changed all those components I said I was going to change and it works simple as that uh, usually does the only ones that don't work really, the ones that have been buggered around with by someone else who's been poking and slipping and probing and shorting things out. Um, but yeah, I changed the output transistors, I checked all the high speed switching diodes in the output stage for the LF output stage. I changed all the semiconductors virtually in the input power supply, the switch mode power supply, and it works. And you notice the other thing I've done is if we zoom in over here a bit let's move it along, it's working, it's powered up at the moment so I'm not going to be poking it but can you see that empty space there with the four holes that's the doubler relay, I've taken it out because I've got a gut feeling they're just a source of problems so I've heard them go click before and as I say playing around with the very rack and then magic smoke is released from the devices so we've changed the two power transistors, the uh, um, switch mode power supply management chip, the driver chip, uh, the resistors, the diodes, and <clears throat> that's about it on there. And then the four output transistors have been changed, even though only two had blown. There was one blown diode, which was diode number 370, I think. Uh, the high speed switching diodes, which are in the gate drive circuit. Um, was blown so there you go so it's got brand new semiconductors all around and it's running on the equivalent parts in the power supply because the original parts are no longer available that manufacture anymore few people have got them but the prices as these semiconductors go out of manufacture as the supply gets dries up obviously supply and demand um, grabs hold of it and the price just goes rocketing so some of these obsolete components, even though they're inferior, are more expensive. All right. So that's uh, that's for you guys. Um, hope you found that interesting. Not much else. So the mixers is a different thing altogether. But the um, the power amplifier boards. This is the third one I've done this week, and by changing those components, I've told you already, 
all three of them have been fixed, all right? So common failure, but don't go half measures on your semiconductors. Change the whole lot. They've been under their power semiconductors. Change them for new ones because it's uh, by far. I think the cost of the semiconductors I put in here with the four transistors, um, four FETs, two trench stop gate transistors and the other chips and everything else, probably about £10 or $13 or something like that. Um, but it's well worth it because it will give it a new lease of life, but generally nothing else ever fails on these, it's just those components. And if you can replace them and um, do a good job, then there's no reason why it should uh, crack on for a long time. So, as I say, subscribe to the link down here. And I hope you enjoyed that. And if you've got a 515, if you've got any questions, give me a uh, drop me a line. I'm retiring soon. Another email just come in. Um, and yeah, good luck with your repair if you decide to do one. Cheers. Signing off.